Can I just say a big welcome to everyone that's joining us but from across the Health Research Institute, from across the departments and, and the university and externally. So a big warm welcome to everyone from there. Um, my name is Jeff Brecken. I'm Head of Research in Sport Physical Activity Research Centre. Um, pleasure uh, in, well, big thanks to Denise really in, in accepting our offer to come and talk to us today, uh, it being um, International Women's Week as well, so the, the timing is perfect. Um, let me give you a little bit of a, a background to, to Dee. Um, Dee Kafari, MBE, uh, the only woman to have sailed non-stop around the world solo uh, in both directions. Um, and I think you've done it six times from what I understand, uh, which is pretty crazy. The only female skipper in the, the Global Challenge in 045 and the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, natural team leader, you'll get a very clear sense uh, when you listen to Dee talk uh, about knowledge, her empathy, resilience, diversity, all, all those really strong um, values in a, a leader that you would want. Um, I'd also add that uh, I know in a former life she was a PE teacher, uh, sports science graduate or human movement studies as was. Uh, used to play volleyball apparently as well. Not sure how much she's uh, picked up a volleyball in, in the last 20 years, but I'm sure she'll tell us. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dee. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of this. Um, if people would turn their videos off, because uh, she's going to share a, a video with us, uh, just to, so we don't eat up the bandwidth. So Dee, over to you, and we'll, we'll look forward to your talk. Thanks very much. Well, it is super nice to join you all, and hopefully I'm sharing my screen with you and uh, get a chance to um, thank you all for having me. I'm gonna hope that you find what I say to be inspiring and maybe enable you to take a few gems away with you. Uh, I'm gonna share my experience on the high seas, uh, some of my learnings, and probably more importantly, some of my mistakes, and help you navigate the uncertainty that may lie ahead for you and demonstrate how I overcame some of the barriers that I face. Um, because at the end of the day, the only thing we can actually be sure of is change. And with that in mind, I've just got a little video to show you that'll help you understand uh, where I'm coming from. Someone once said, if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. I'm Dee Kafari. I spend a lot of my time working in conditions like these. I've raced around the world six times, with a crew, on my own, the right way, and even the wrong way. It's not always where you want to be. Oh God, I'm frustrated right now. And then it's the only place you want to be. At times, it can get pretty exciting. I was a school teacher until I was 27 and had never been out to sea. The old job still comes in handy though. <laughs> At times it can get a little rough, but you do get the odd moment of peace. Other times it is just outright brutal. But you get up, you get moving, and you keep racing. Now we're down to the final 500, and they're bloody right there. And I'm really tired. I might look back and say this is fun. That was pretty fun, actually. I'm going to continue to dare, dream and discover. It's not easy, but the good bits always outweigh the bad. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight as to what I've been doing while I've been sailing. Six times around the world, as Jeff said. And he knew me better as a volleyball player back a few moons ago, a long time we've just realised. And uh, there's always that Tom Hanks reference where you talk to the volleyball called Wilson. And I, I'm pleased to say I haven't reverted to that on any of my offshore races, but you never know. Uh, I just put this quote up from Richard Branson because I just think that stepping and putting yourself outside your comfort zone is really hard. But actually anyone willing to go that little extra distance will be amazed at what they can achieve uh, when you push yourself. It's all about putting the right support around you. It's about having self-belief and a little bit of self-confidence. And I am a firm believer that if you take people on the journey with you, then they actually want to help 
and help make that a success. Like they want to see you succeed. So you're not only reach your goals, but quite often you'll surpass them. Now, my sailing career started with a career change back uh, in 2000 when I moved away from the world of being a physical education teacher and kind of reinvented myself. And the opportunity to sail around the world came up. And this was in the Global Challenge, so Che Blythe's race, where he believed that everybody should have the opportunity to sail around the world. But what this race did was sail around the world what's called the wrong way. So against the prevailing winds and currents. So you go down the Atlantic, when you get to the bottom, you turn right. And the reason that it's so difficult is because if you were to stop and do nothing, you'd actually go backwards. The currents, the winds, everything's pushing against you. So you zigzag your way around the world. And this race had 12 identical boats with a professional skipper on each boat. And this was 2004. And I was the only female professional skipper in the group of 12. And when I come to my most recent round the world a couple of years ago, you'll see that not a lot has changed in our sport. Uh, we had 17 paying people on board. Now, this group of people ranged from those that had absolutely no sailing experience at all, those that had quite a lot of sailing experience and those that thought they had some sailing experience. And I can categorically say that that middle group was the hardest group to manage. But those that little bit of knowledge is sometimes dangerous. That was that group. But here I was responsible for 17 people all paying for their adventure of a lifetime. Some people wanted to go and lose themselves. Some people wanted to find themselves. And I had to manage that and get them all the way around the world. So we would be at sea for five to six weeks, arrive somewhere, celebrate, have a massive party, forget how bad it was, convince them all to get back on the boat. And off we went again. Now, when I was doing that, it, I understood then that this was a move through from a sailing management exercise to a man management exercise, and then it becomes a conflict management exercise. You can just imagine that a group of 17 people living in a 70 foot space with no ability to kind of leave and go for a walk and come back. It's a bit of a melting pot of emotions. So it was a real experience of me learning about myself and learning how to lead a group of very diverse people and we laugh because we could say that that probably led to me sailing solo around the world so literally off the back of that race I took the exact same boat without the 17 people and on the same route but non-stop so I was sailing again against the prevailing winds and currents but I set off uh, non-stop and to date, only five of us have ever done that, four men and myself. So yet again, I'm still the flag flyer for the only female to have sailed nonstop against the prevailing winds and currents around the world, probably because it's not the easiest thing. I hadn't even lived on my own when I set off to do this race, let alone sail on my own. Even all the practicing I did, because it was in the English Channel, it's quite busy. I always had somebody on board just in case. So when I set off and waved goodbye to everyone and I sailed past the Lizard Lighthouse in Cornwall and the man started the stopwatch, the last words Sir Che Blythe said to me was, don't cry about it, it's been done before. So of course, the first thing I did was burst into tears. And I soon learned that actually make a cup of tea, reevaluate everything and then make the big decisions. And that's pretty much the routine I had for 178 days that it took me to go around the world. It was a complete emotional roller coaster, extreme highs, extreme lows, the good bits, the bad bits. I, I didn't know how to manage all my emotions and all this excess energy that was coming out in these emotions. I then learned as I moved through to a more professional arena that that's wasted energy that's not helping the boat move forwards. But at this stage, this was about an opportunity it was about becoming the first female ever to do something. So they're, they're very rare. World firsts are very rare these days. So I jumped at it and I basically learned how to do it along the way. You miss Christmases, birthdays, weddings, funerals. There's a lot that goes on in the world in six months when you're missing from it. But it's uh, 
it makes you reevaluate what's important in life and makes you live with just what you have. And therefore, you really appreciate the little things in life again. So it's a really nice way to reevaluate your priorities in life, I should say. From there, I realized why everybody goes the right way around the world. So when they go down the Atlantic and they turn left, the pre prevailing winds, prevailing currents, everything pushing you in the right direction. It's faster for a start and it's exhilarating, it's exciting. And it was my step up from being an adventurer to the professional racing league. I was sailing now against some of the best sailors in the world. I did the race called the Vendée Globe. And some of you may have heard from it because it's just taken part now this winter. And in lockdown, it probably had more people following it than ever before because it was actually a sporting event that was taking place. But you leave from France, you set sail and you come back to France and you're not allowed to stop or get outside assistance at all. So as we went down this race in 2008, there were 30, 33 of us on the start line and it was a war of attrition. Only 11 of us finished. Now, if somebody had told me at the start, oh, you can have a top 10 place, I probably would have bitten their arm off. I knew how to sail for a long time on my own, but what I didn't know was how to sail at that intensity and that pressure and at that speed. When I got down the Atlantic, I had an email from the guy that eventually won. And he said, don't forget to turn left, which made me laugh because I was just really excited he knew who I was. But obviously my reputation of going the wrong way had preceded me. So I went down the Atlantic and you turn left into the Southern Ocean and suddenly everything's helping you move in the right direction. And I was just thinking, wow, how do I slow down down here? And then you realize that actually the boat is designed to accelerate, to surf, you're meant to go fast and slowly you become acclimatized to these extreme conditions and you get used to it and actually what you get used to, you get comfortable with, and then you want to push a little bit harder. And so how I sailed at the end of the race was very different to how I sailed at the start of the race. A massive learning curve. And I finished in sixth place, which was just phenomenal. And I was super happy with that, as you can imagine. But I think what I learned on that trip round, especially, was that you have to give yourself a bit of a break every now and again. You have to give yourself some credit. You have to pat yourself on the back. Um, and I moved from, as I say, an adventurer to a professional um, arena. And the biggest step forwards I made wasn't in my sailing or my skills. It was actually in the psychology. And I know that Jeff Brecken will laugh because I didn't have any interest in sports psychology when I was doing my degree. I was really black and white. I wanted the science. I wanted the physiology and the biomechanics. And the psychology was just too vague for me. And now here I am kicking myself because actually it's what I use the most for all my round the worlds. And I eventually went to see a sports psychologist and they knew I didn't want to be there. And after 30 minutes, I stopped talking and I was like, wow, how did you do that? And he said, well, do you want to know what you told me? And I was thinking, wow, did I? And what was really interesting was I was a very negative person, which may surprise you given what I've gone on to do but I was very quick to say what I didn't want to happen. I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to come last. I don't want to let the team down, but I would never say what I did want to happen. It was almost, I was fearful of actually putting myself out there and saying what I did want to achieve. So I had to learn to spin that on its head and become a very positive person. And that also included how people communicated with me while I was racing. I didn't want them to come down and say, oh, yeah, but Jason's boat's going faster than yours, because actually I can't control Jason's boat. I needed them to check in with me that I was in a good place. How's your boat speed? Are you happy? Are you on your numbers? So that everything had a reference and a control that I was on top of, that I could make happen. And that whole change in aspect was really important on how I developed and changed as a racer over the course of that race. Now, more recently in 2017, 18, I skippered, turned the tide on plastic in the, the Volvo Ocean Race, now called the Ocean Race. And it was a real mixed bag. I took on the project and it was a culmination of probably all my career coming together. So 80% of my crew were under 30, having never sailed around the world before. 
But don't get me wrong, they were really good skilled sailors, but they were Olympic sailors or America's Cup sailors or match racers, but they hadn't experienced the Southern Ocean or the round the world environment. So this was the first experience for them. Uh, they were youth based under 30. I had a squad of 13, there were 10 of us on the boat. And for the first time ever, I was fielding a fully mixed team, five girls, five guys, and it hadn't been done before. But obviously as an advocate for women sailing and pushing the boundaries, they asked me basically to put my money where my mouth was and deliver that. So I couldn't say no to that. And then when you think about being a teacher, it's about empowering the next generation and providing pathways and opportunities. So I really liked the youth aspect. We had 10 nationalities, so we were the United Nations on board. And I had a very steep learning curve about understanding and empathizing with different cultures and na nations coming together and how they communicated. And then fundamentally, we had a really succinct sustainability message. Our focus was on single use plastics. And normally when you're trying to talk about the sponsor or try and get a message through, it's quite contrived. But actually to have a youth focused team talking about sustainability was just a match made in heaven. The synergy was just so natural and it came across so effortlessly, totally aware that as guardians of our marine environment, ocean health is super important, but also it's their generation that have to create and facilitate change for their children, because it's probably my generation that have caused the problem. So it was a really interesting project. I really enjoyed it. And as a race, it goes on for 10 months. So I don't think there's another sporting trophy that lasts for that long or has that kind of endurance about it. It takes all your emotion, all your attention and fatigue and the pressure just absolutely drains you. You don't realize you're that tired until possibly two weeks after the finish and then suddenly it hits you like a tidal wave. But it was interesting to learn how to manage these professional sailors but still frustrated with results. So managing disappointment, yet encouraging them to get back on the boat and do the next leg. Managing team morale and getting their momentum to build and go again. Each time it, it took a little bit of adjustment and I really had to invest time and effort in building and creating an atmosphere where the team felt that they could speak openly, they could contribute and have opinions that would not only be heard but actually listened to uh, and it was a massive investment in team but I had to facilitate those debriefs so that everybody could understand and process their disappointment and frustrations so that they could get back on board the boat and move forwards and we had a common objective that we wanted to make sure that we could continue to progressively get better and better and constantly improve no matter what the result, we still wanted to get better. And our food has a major impact on morale. And when it's just yourself, it's not so bad because if you have a bad day, it doesn't affect anyone around you. But when you're a team and a high performance team, one person's impact on the whole team is amazing. And food is a massive factor in that, especially when you've got 10 nationalities and 10 different reactions and attitude to food. We eat freeze dried food because it weighs very little and it's very easy to stack and store. And literally then all we do is boil water, add it to the food and 10 minutes later you get an amazing meal that's very nutritious. That probably explains some of my cooking at home and you'll be pleased to know in the last 12 months I haven't managed to go offshore so I've been able to practice my cooking. Um, but what you get bored of is the texture. It has the same kind of baby food texture and you're craving something that you can't have like the crunch of an apple or the juice of an orange simple things and uh, it's really amazing how everybody picks their favorite food and how the repetitive nature creates a boredom to it and after a few months you're like oh i never want to eat that again so it was really interesting to see everybody's different reactions and hydration plays a massive part in that as well it's really obvious to an athlete in a consistent environment you know they're hot and sweating and they want to drink and it's really easy to manage but when you're in conditions where temperatures change 
you go from the tropics to the freezing sub-zero temperatures of the Southern Ocean, you have long periods of inactivity and then huge periods of lots of activity where when you're sweating, you can't always see it or feel it. It's really hard to try and keep up the hydration of all the sailors. So convincing them that they still need to drink between three and five litres in a 24 hour period because you put more clothes on because you want to stay warm. So going to the toilet becomes more difficult. The motion of the boat is sometimes difficult to even go to the bathroom. So it's really interesting how all these factors affect the sailor wanting to eat or drink. But it has a massive impact on how we feel and how we can process the information and ultimately the ability to make decisions. I always knew that if I couldn't make a decision, I needed a good feed, a drink, some sleep, and literally 20 minutes later, I'd wake up as a completely new person. Talking of sleep, that's an interesting factor because you're sailing 24 seven and you're constantly wanting to push the boat. So when you're on your own, you manage catnaps, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there. And a long sleep for me was an hour and a half. I would sleep and sometimes you'll be in a situation where you could just wake up, check everything, and then maybe go back to sleep. It really depends on where you are. It depends on what weather systems you're dealing with where you are in location to other shipping or other competitors or even a coastline. So you really have to pick your moments to sleep, but you get very practiced at it. And it's, it takes about seven days for your body to adapt. And I can only liken it to any new parents. Probably before you had your baby at home, you slept throughout the night. And as soon as that baby comes home, suddenly you're responsible for another life and you hear the slightest sound, the slightest gurgle, the slightest cry. And that just is amazing how we adapt to what we're responsible for. So when it's your own life in your hands, you sleep listening to the sound of the boat. And as soon as those sounds change slightly, you're awake because you know at the end of the day, it's your life in your hands. So you do wake up. In contrast, when you're with a crew, you get slightly better quality sleep because when you're sleeping, some other people in your crew are awake, pushing the boat at 100% still. And then they have the responsibility to wake you up either for your watch, because you do four hours on, four hours off, or if you need to do a sail change or a maneuver, then you wake up, you help with everything, and then you try and go back to sleep. So in your four hours on, four hours off, you probably, once you eat something, drink something, manage your personal admin, maybe fix something, maybe do a couple of sail changes, you're probably looking at a couple of hours sleep. But again, you do adapt. And the hard thing is coming back to land where suddenly you have a daytime and a nighttime and people expect you to sleep throughout the night. But I have to say, I'm getting pretty good at adapting now and I do love my sleep. The temperature, as I said before, makes a massive difference. And this was in the Southern Ocean, this image. It does snow at sea, it is true. It can be agonizingly cold and it's remote and it's hostile and it's just quite a miserable existence. You're trying to manage yourself in these conditions and then try and put a race environment on top of that and make yourself push hard. So it's quite a mental game that you play. Physically, you may be willing, but your mind is really struggling to deal with it all. But it's really interesting in the extremes of temperature, it's actually the hot temperatures that are really hard to deal with. There's very little um, there's very little kind of protection from the sun. You're out there exposed to the elements all the time and that's really hard to manage. Whereas when it's cold, you have lots of good technical clothing. You can eat hot food, drink hot drinks and you can kind of combat your cold, but it's really hard to beat the heat. So that's probably the hardest way to deal with. And it, it's relentless, but... Um, you always tend to finish with a good tan and I think it's just being weathered. I think you get rust in the cold, wet conditions and you get sunburn in the, in the sunny conditions. Now, one aspect, this was in the 2017 race where out of the fleet of skippers, I was the only female skipper. And I said that my first round the world race in 2004, there were 12 of us. And again, I was the only female skipper. So you can see as a sport, we're very slow to change. I, I do think it's quite positive. There is momentum in the right direction, but it's 
a slow process and it's a traditional sport with a lot of heritage and it's a lot of people that are comfortable sailing with who they know so they don't really like change so it takes a little bit of time to get the momentum going I think what was interesting as the only female skipper was my understanding now but at the time I didn't really understand it of how stressed I got going into a skipper's briefing or a press conference as the only female and I was getting what was now what I now understand was imposter syndrome of just thinking that I didn't have any credibility to be there and what could I contribute nobody would listen to me and there may have been an atmosphere created but what was interesting was a lot of it was actually in my head my own self-doubt my own panic about where I'd stepped up to now if I'd told the guys that this was the atmosphere that I thought they were creating they would have been devastated I'm sure but to me that's how I felt and every single stopover before every leg I'd have to have a little word with myself before I went through that door take a deep breath and be like you've got every right to be here none of the other skippers had sailed around the world on their own none of them had done it as many times as I had so this whole kind of opinion that I had was not founded on any fact it was just all created in my head to give me this nervous energy and to put me on the back foot almost but it was amazing after all this experience all these miles I'd amassed that actually I could put on this pretense for my crew to create a positive environment for them to grow in yet I myself was really struggling at times to face the competition that was around me and I don't think that there's, uh, you know, anybody else that would think any differently in that environment. I think because it's so obvious, the difference, it's so stark. Even the press conferences that ask the boats in position one, two and three about tactics and strategy. They'd ask one of the other guys about sustainability. And then they'd always ask me about women in sailing. And I was just thinking, you're asking the wrong person. I am a woman in sailing maybe you should ask the guys and it took me the whole 10 months to have the confidence to actually throw that question back to the media and kind of make a point and actually I got a lot of pats on the back for that but it, it was you know a whole process for me to go through to have the confidence to actually say something it's interesting that any pushback for a mixed environment is generally from people and especially male sailors that have never sailed in a mixed environment those that have tried it have realized that actually mother nature doesn't really care what gender you are, what color you are. She's got to throw the same weather at you and you've got to do the same job. But those that have experienced it understand that it's irrelevant. Those that haven't experienced it have a fear factor that, oh, as a female, you're not going to step up and deliver. So it's really interesting. And I think slowly we're getting enough females experience to display that it is OK. We're getting enough guys to give it a try and realize there is no difference and our sport is moving forwards but it's been a really slow process I have to say so as I said I led my team which was fully 50 50 five guys five girls and physically we're never going to meet the same performance as the guys you know that's that's clear although some girls are pretty strong I have to say but there's so many diverse roles within a boat's crew and different jobs to do at different times that require different elements that it's really easy to put the key people in the key places. And what we spent a lot of time doing is trying to play to our strengths, learn about our weaknesses and address them, but play to the strengths with the people that we had. But every now and again, even our team who are really aware of it, over the course of 10 months, we had to stop and reevaluate where we were because we slipped into old habits. So I would find that we'd step up for a maneuver and I'd have to say, stop, everybody look. And all the guys were holding bits of rope that were controlling the sails because they're very important. And all the girls were either grinding or lifting hundred kilo sails across the boat. And I was like, hold on, are we all doing what we're good at like are we playing to our strengths and you'd realize everyone would look around and really sheepishly embarrassed and say ah no you're right and it was a confidence thing I had Olympic sailors that had won medals 
But because she wasn't confident to say, I'll trim that sail and make us go fast, she just took the back step and let the guy do it. And it was amazing to see this natural pecking order. And I would have to keep swapping it around, pushing people into different places. It was a real lesson to me, something I really learned. And actually, it was worth spending the time stopping every now and again to make sure we reset so that we did play to our strengths. As I said, I invested a lot of time in creating the right atmosphere, but communication is absolutely key to any team, especially over a period of 10 months, looking to perform at their best. And you can imagine, we just spent three weeks on a boat together. The last thing we wanted to do 48 hours later was spend three hours in a room talking about those three weeks. You know, we were tired of each other. We wanted to sleep, we wanted to eat, we wanted to do anything but go through it all again. But this was my opportunity to create an atmosphere where they felt valued, where they felt they contributed and where they felt they could be heard and listened to. So I, some people are very willing to bang the drum once they get an opportunity, but it's the quiet ones, those that don't say anything that need help, that need nurturing to speak up because they're probably the ones that have got the most to add. But what's really interesting is actually once they start to understand the process, it does get easier each time. So the investment in time and effort was completely worth it because the team I sailed with at the end of the 10 months compared to the team I sailed with at the start were chalk and cheese. They'd grown, they'd developed, they'd been empowered. And it was just amazing to see that growth that I'd helped facilitate. So I was super proud, but it did take some nurturing. And uh, I think also it was the little de details. Understanding that I had to create the vision. I had to create the vision and have the integrity to create the right environment that worked for the people around me. If I wanted to get the best from them, I needed to give them the best environment to work in. And it also allowed us to reevaluate where we were for each leg so that we were all on the same page when we stepped on the boat to keep moving forwards. Because there were frustrations and disappointments on the way. There were obviously going to be niggles. And if we could get them out in the open, it's much easier. And that's tough because I'm definitely stick your head in the sand type person and hopefully it'll go away. But you, as a leader, you have to address it all. So I found it pretty tough going. But I would say that any team today is tested way beyond what we ever thought possible given our current environment. And I think being able to adapt and overcome, be fluid, be agile, be open-minded is really important. One thing I really noticed with a young team was their lack of inhibitions. They didn't really have any constraints by habits or what they'd done before. They were super open-minded to go, well, let's try something new. And they would look at videos and photos of all the other boats and look at changes that we could do. And it was me that had to consciously change and be open-minded and say, okay, well, we'll try it. And if it works, we'll keep it. And if it doesn't, then we'll go back to how we were. And actually, I, I felt empowered and actually rejoiced in that new way of looking at things and that bit of excitement and that bit of kind of different thinking outside the box. It wasn't the same as before, because a couple of times I felt myself say, oh, no, you know, when we do this, we do it like this. But I had to remind myself we didn't win when we did it like that. So maybe a new way is a better way. And I think that's been. One of the things that I had to keep in mind um, looking forwards, because this last 12 months has been pretty tough. There's a lot of uncertainty around, but it's just like a leg sailing offshore. Um, you don't know what's around the corner. You know a forecast, but it's not always accurate. So you have to be pretty flexible. You have to stay positive and you have to try and find the best of something and be willing to reinvent yourself. Try a new way because the old way might not be the only way and it might not be the best way anymore. Anyway, what I really want to do is open up to questions because I'm yours for the time that you've got me. And rather than have it as a one way transmit, it'd be much more beneficial to people if I can answer questions and help um, you guys get the answers from me that will help you going forwards. So I will say thank you and stop sharing my screen and 
come back and answer some questions for you.